Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there in this difficult time. I sincerely do. Today, I want to talk to you about constraint satisfaction problems, which is a really important class of problems that arise naturally and that these days are one of those many things that we sort of only half think of as artificial intelligence because the machines are so much better than the people at them and the algorithms are so algorithmy. But the roots of all this is in artificial intelligence and there's still a lot of AI exploration of this class of problems. So I just want to go through it a little bit, poke at it, and give you a summary. This I should say this is a topic where the text course textbook is fantastic and I would highly recommend reading those sections especially because they have nice diagrams and nice explanations. But if we're going to talk about constraint satisfaction problems, what's a constraint satisfaction problem? Well, it's a collection the state has a special form, right? In our Citing tile puzzles, the state was just the positions of all the tiles on the puzzle. A constraint satisfaction problem can be thought of as a problem where the state is assignment of values to variables. So I have some collection of variables. I'm going to bind them to values. And I want to bind them in such a way that I move from state to state, different bindings, different states, to get to some goal state that I want. So that's the same there. But unlike pathfinding problems, the depth is limited because there's only so many variables to bind. And unlike pathfinding problems, the constraints tend to be of mathematical form or at least logical form. And that makes them kind of interesting. If we want an example of this. I think cryptorhythms are a good way to go. This is a little cryptorhythm puzzle. And the idea of cryptorhythm puzzles is that you try to assign values to the variables such that this equation works. So I can set O to zero maybe and you know T to one and G to two and U to three. But if I do that, then the math won't work. It won't add up. And in fact, there are a few more rules. No two letters can have the same value. So once I've assigned zero to O, I can't assign zero to T, G, or U. The other constraint, the other rule, is that numbers don't have leading zeros, so none of T, G, or O can actually be zero. So we can sit here and try to solve this, and we can think about it in terms of, well, if O can't be zero, I'm gonna start with O because it's on the left, which means it can't be zero. And I also have O plus O, which means that this digit T has to be even, it absolutely must. So we can't set O to zero. What happens if we set O to one? Well, that means that one and one is two, so that means that T must be two and once you've decided that T is two and O is one, then we need to find a G and U such that the math works out. So I have, oh wait, but the carry doesn't work. You no, know, the carry works fine. So the, there's no carry here. So this is just two plus G plus U, or two plus G equals one U. And for example, I can set G to nine and nine and two is 11. Oh, that isn't gonna work out. What if I set G to eight, then eight and two is 10, but that makes U be zero. Seven here, two and seven is nine. I think that works. So if I put, nope, but then I, I don't have a carry out. So, so we made a mistake somewhere, right? Uh, it's pretty apparent that we're gonna have to back up, right? We're gonna have to try something different. And so you can see that it's kind of hard sometimes to find these things. So T has to be even, so it can't be three. So we'll go back to T. Let's, let's go back and do this thing. Let's just do it like this. I think this works, oh, maybe not. Okay, 
anyway, let's replace, uh, we still are gonna try O as one. We're gonna replace T now, it can't be three. We decided it can't be two, so it must be four. I'm not sure exactly how I fill these in, but. Yep, so O is one, T is four now, and if I have T is four, then I can set G to nine and U to three, and I'll get four plus nine is 13, and, oh no, but this has to be a two then. O has to be one. So one and one, two, two, and something. So we just didn't search this space. So you can see how really fast you get lost in this. And so I drew a little diagram to sort of point out what's kind of going on here in terms of a state space. What's our state space? Well, the state space starts out with none of these variables assigned values. Uh, we have what's called the empty partial assignment. We've picked some of these things and you know, we start out with nothing being assigned. And we're gonna try O is zero, and that doesn't work. We'll try O is one, and that might work. And when I've decided O is one, then T has to be two. So I can, when I go down here then, I'll pick a different variable, let's say T. T can't be zero, because O is already zero. T can't be one, because T has to be even. In fact, we know T is two. So now I've got this state where I have one, one, two, black, black, one. And so now if I set G here to be, seven, six, no, it has to be uh, 11. So T can't be two and O can't be one. So I'm gonna have to backtrack out of this and keep searching. So what I end up with is a search tree and the leaves of the tree are total assignments of values to variables where every variable in the problem, all one, two, three, four of them in this case have, are assigned a value, but not all leaves are valid solutions because they don't obey the constraints. And so this is the space that we're gonna be searching around in, in these problems is this space of constraints, of, of variable assignments under constraint. And that's the basic idea here. And there's sort of three variants on this idea. There's the simple constraint satisfaction problem, find any assignment of values to variables that satisfies the constraints. There's the optimization problem, where we don't want just any assignment, we want some good assignment. So in our, in our cryptorhythm puzzle, we can imagine, find the smallest digits that satisfy this, or the largest digits that satisfy this. So take the sum of all the digits, whatever. I have some objective function, something I'm trying to optimize, and I don't take just any solution, I'm looking for a good solution for some measure of good. And of course, this is really a constraint optimization problem, because I'm not, I'm optimizing, but I'm optimizing subject to the constraints. So that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. The classic constraint satisfaction problem is three sat, three clause, clause normal form, uh, conjunctive normal form, three satisfiability. So remember from your discrete math background, this idea of propositional logic, the idea that I have variables that are atoms in logical formula, they can be either true or false. And I have some formula, and here I'm gonna put the formula in what's called conjunctive normal form. The ors are gonna be inside what are called clauses, and the ands are gonna join clauses. And so this is a conjunctive normal form formula. And what we're trying to find is an assignment of true or false to A, B, or C, such that the whole formula is true. And that means that for the whole formula to be true, since they're added together, each of these clauses has to be true separately. So for example, if I chose not A false, B true, C false, then that's not a satisfying assignment for this formula. It doesn't even matter what happens over here because this clause will be false. And it turns out for short three set formulas like this, they're easily satisfiable. Let's choose A true to satisfy the first clause. That means we have to choose B true, <laughs> excuse me, to satisfy the second clause. And it doesn't matter at all what I do with C at that point because I have the third clause satisfied by just A and B. So 
that's the sat problem. It looks easy. It looks easy to find satisfying assignments, but as the number of clauses gets large, or the number of variables get large, this problem is NP hard. It's NP complete, because of course, if I could guess a satisfying assignment, I could check it in linear time, just evaluate the formula and see that it evaluates to true. But it's NP hard. It's, as far as we know, gonna take time exponential in the number of variables, clauses, something, as the problem grows, as the number of symbols in the problem grows, this problem is going to get hard very, very fast in general. And so the obvious thing to do is just what we did before. We say, well, let's start with a partial assignment in which nothing is assigned. The variables are not assigned true or false. And we'll pick a variable and in this case a and we'll try to value it and if we value it then we get a new state right where a is one and b and c are unassigned and in that situation we can see that we can forget about a over here we have to just reduce this clause to b or c we can forget about this whole clause and over here we can get rid of this whole clause so once i've done that the state really boils down to B and C being unassigned. So I pick one, assign it true, and I'm essentially done. And that's the Davis-Putnam-Loveland-Lockhurst algorithm, which was the Davis-Putnam algorithm when I was young, but has since been uh, had more attributions added to it which is just a simple state space search of the space of satisfying assignments. You try assigning a true and then recursively try to solve the remaining formula. You try assigning a false and then recursively try solving the remaining formula. If you didn't solve either of these successfully, then the formula has no solution and so you're done. So this is just breadth first search to a fixed depth that's the number of variables. There's nothing very fancy about it. Now, it may occur to you, looking at our demo problem here, that it matters what order you take the variables. If we, in this case we were to start by valuing C first, well, we could value C to true and we'd be done. We wouldn't have to think about A or B at all. That's absolutely right. So one of the things we need to do is think about what heuristics to use. First of all, if you have variables that have that are, that are in a large number of clauses, you might want to start by branching on those because that'll cut things down really quickly in the problem. And if you have clauses that have been shortened by removing stuff, you might want to branch on those variables earlier than variables that are part of full three clauses. So in general, what we say is that you want to branch on the most constrained variable first and what does most constrained here mean? Well, enough stuff, you know, the stuff that sort of will cause a failure as early as possible, where there's not, you know, where there's not so many choices for that one. And that's a general heuristic that works a lot in all kinds of constraint, well, in all kinds of constraint satisfaction problems. The other thing is we had a choice of whether to try true or false up here, right? I could absolutely have searched when I was started with A, I could have chosen A true or A false, and because we were focused on the left clause, we naturally chose true, but I could have chosen false first. Uh, so I, which one should I try? Well, there again, probably heuristics of some kind. And the heuristic that I might wanna choose are you know, again, you want to cut the problem down as fast as you can, so you try the value that satisfies the most clauses. And another heuristic that works out well, that's the sort of my former uh, mentor in grad school, Jimmy Crawford, popularized this in a system called Tableau. Try a value that produces the most short clauses. For, so for three sat, if you can get a three sat problem through search down to a two sat problem, it turns out that two CNF sat is linear solvable. And so if I can get rid of all those annoying three clauses, then I can find out 
either find an assignment or find that it's unsat for that branch really, really quickly. And so in general, what we say is choose the least constraining thing first. Choose the thing that leaves you the most freedom to, when you're solving a CSP, to uh, extend the solution. And that's, that's a general heuristic. Well, so that's satisfaction. What if I want some kind of constraint optimization? So I'm not looking here for something that just satisfies the CNF formula, but some, a solution, particular solution to the CNF formula. Let's say that having A true is worth five, having B true is worth two, and having C true is worth one. I might wanna find a particular satisfying assignment for that formula that maximizes my score and so you basically do the same thing, but your heuristics are gonna be adjusted now. One of the things you should notice is because a complete search, a depth first search will find an optimal solution, all the solutions, it'll eventually hit the optimal one if you don't run out of time first, which for big searches you always will. And the heuristics will sort of involve scoring as you go so that you try to go down branches that look more promising from a score point of view not just the ones that are most likely to achieve a solution so those are the fundamentals of constraint satisfaction and as you see it's sort of nothing too special in terms of what we looked at you know we think of constraint satisfaction and pathfinding as two different problems and they are but they're both just state space search problems. They're both often solved with complete search. And for satisfiability, we have built complete solvers that use a whole bunch of tricks to speed things up. Some of the tricks I've talked about, plus miles and miles more, and go very, very fast. They can solve very large instances of not just three satisfiability, but general CNF satisfiability. And it turns out those are really, really useful. In particular, over at Intel and down at AMD, they spend a lot of time trying to prove unsatisfiability of very large formula in CNF form because that's part of how they do error checking for their processors. They'll write down in logic, in propositional logic, a property that the processor is supposed to hold, have, and then prove that that property is never violated by running a big old unsat checker. And so lots and lots of CPU cycles are consumed over there doing that. And that's okay, because that's what Intel makes for a living is CPU cycles. So that's that. Thanks for listening. Hope that that was useful. As again, I hope you'll stay safe and well during this difficult time. And I will talk to you again very soon.